Uh, welcome to lecture 3, uh, segment 2 of this course, uh, Demystifying the Brain. So, in the last lecture, we talked about uh, brain structure and this lecture, we began to talk about uh, neurons and neural signaling. In the previous segment of this lecture, uh, we were talking about uh, different uh, signaling components in a neuron. Uh, we said there are so four components, uh, there is a dendritic processing, then the summation in the soma, then there is axonal propagation and finally, there is synaptic transmission or neurotransmission. Uh, we simply described these signaling uh, processes, but we did not describe what is the cellular and molecular basis of these uh, signaling processes. How are these uh, processes generated? So, that is the subject of uh, the current segment. So, in this segment, we will talk about how is the membrane potential generated? How does a neuron generate its electricity? Right? Then, we will talk about how does an action potential uh, form? How is it generated? And then, we will talk about axon propagation and neuron transmission. And uh, we will basically talk about the molecular basis of all these four signaling processes. So, we have uh, described in the last segment that uh, neuron can live in two states. There is a resting state where the membrane potential is at a constant value of about minus 70 millivolts and then there is exerted state where the membrane potential exhibits this fast spiking activity uh, called the action potentials. Now, where is this voltage coming from? Now, we must remember that any cell right, and, and, and neuron 2 uh, lives in an uh, environment which is full of ions, it is an, it's an ionic medium. So, both the interior and the exterior of a neuron right, is perme are permeated by an ionic medium and this medium consists of ions uh, like uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions and calcium ions and these are separated by the cell membrane or the plasma membrane which consists of uh, two sheets of lipids or you know, fatty molecules and uh, they, they separate these two uh, media. And these ions are distributed differently uh, both in inside and outside of the cell. So, for example, uh, if you look at the table uh, given here, the inside of the cell, the sodium concentration is low and outside it is high and uh, potassium concentration is uh, uh, high inside and uh, low outside uh, and then similarly, chloride is uh, low inside and, and, uh, and high outside and calcium is high outside and low inside. So, the thing is the, the four kinds of uh, ionic species are distributed differently between inside and outside of the neuron. So, in addition to ions and then there is a membrane, there are also these structures called ion channels which are like holes set inside the, uh, inside the cell membrane, the plasma membrane and these are actually large protein molecules. Uh, which, which have some kind of a you know, passage uh, in, the, in the middle of them. This passage allows ions to move from inside to outside. And there are many different kinds of ion channels and very often these channels are specific to certain kinds of ions. So, for example, there are uh, sodium channels uh, which allow passage of sodium ions or there are calcium channels uh, which allow passage of uh, calcium ions and so on and so forth. Uh, lots of channels are mixed, uh, they can allow uh, multiple ionic uh, species, but uh, typically uh, channels are specific to certain kinds of ions. So, very often the channels are named after the ions that they allow. So, you, have, you can have uh, sodium channels, potassium channels, chloride channels and so on and so, so forth. Now, what is most interesting and important about the channels is that uh, they are gated. So, they are, so they, the passage can be closed if you want right or left open if you want. So, these uh, opening and closing uh, activities of channels can be controlled by many factors. So, the, so the ion channels can exist in open or closed states and therefore, the, the flow of ions through them can be controlled by various processes. So, this the process by which a channel can be opened or closed is called gating right. Uh, controlling the gating activity of channel is called, it is called gating and there are uh, uh, several kinds of uh, gating mechanisms. We will talk about only two in this uh, current lecture because other two are not relevant to the current discussion. So, there is something called voltage gating where by changing the membrane potential, you can change the uh, open close or uh, state of the channel. For example, in this slide, you can see on the left a channel is closed. Uh, you can see kind of a, a ball like structure which is blocking the passage and there is also kind of a chain there. Actually, this is only a pictorial representation. I mean, in the aerial channel, you do not have balls and chains and stuff like that. Uh, it is just a conceptual representation. So, on the left side, you see a channel which is blocked and uh, the ions are not able to go through that. And then you increase the voltage 
uh, then that opens the channel, uh, then the ions are able to pass. Okay, so this kind of a gating is called voltage gating. Then there is another kind of gating which is very important for neurotransmission. In this case, the factor that opens the gate of the channel uh, is not voltage but a chemical uh, which is called a ligand. So, this kind of gating is called a ligand gating. So, in this figure you can see that uh, on the left side of the slide, you can see the channel is in the closed state and then on the top of the channel you see a couple of red objects hovering over top on top of the channel. Uh, uh, these are actually uh, molecules of a neurotransmitter uh, called acetylcholine. Okay, and uh, in the in the left figure, you see the acetylcholine is not yet uh, is not yet come into contact with the channel, and on the right you see that the acetylcholine molecule has uh, come into contact with the channel and actually bound with the channel with the receptor of the channel, and as a result of that, the channel opens and then it allows passage of uh, ions. So this kind of a gating, which is uh, mediated by a molecule or a ligand, is called ligand gating. So, we just talked about some of the cell molecular machinery in the, in the neuron uh, which are responsible for electrical activity of the neuron, but exactly how do you control this molecular machinery to control the membrane voltage and produce uh, neural activities like action potentials. So, let us start from basics. So, we need to first look at the concept of uh, equilibrium potential. Uh, some of these concepts uh, you might have heard, you might have become familiar with in your high school uh, electrochemistry. So, let us quickly revise that. So, imagine there is a compartment uh, which has a you know there is a vessel which has two compartments left and right and both compartments are filled with uh, you know um, uh, potassium chloride right, solution. On the left side the concentration of KCl is high, on the right side it is low and uh, the two compartments are separated by a membrane uh, which is permeable to both potassium and chloride. So, as you know that because there is a concentration gradient from the left to the right, uh, both potassium and chloride ions uh, move to the right. Okay, and uh, so uh, and this process keeps continuing until the concentrations, concentrations of the KCl on both sides are equal. So, at the end of it you will just have a, a vessel in which both compartments have equal amounts of uh, KCl. So, nothing very interesting happens in this case. Now, let us take a slightly different situation where uh, you have a beaker and, that the, and there is a high concentration KCl on the left side and low concentration KCl on the right side like before. But this time the mem membrane that separates the two compartments is semi permeable. That is it allows only potassium to pass, but not chloride. Oh, so, in this situation uh, since potassium is allowed to pass and this potassium is at high concentration on the left side and low on the right, uh, potassium from left starts more diffusing towards the right and crossing the membrane uh, following the chemical gradient because chemical concentration is high on the left and low on the right. So, there is a chemical gradient right driving the flow of potassium from left to right. But as this keeps happening, uh, the potassium ions keep building up on the right side and creating a positive charge and therefore, uh, increasing the voltage on the right compartment. As this keeps happening, the voltage on the right compartment keeps increasing, uh, thereby creating an electrical gradient, which counters the, the, uh, the chemical gradient, which was pre-existing. So, at some point, the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient exactly counteract each other and annul each other. So, at this point there, there will not be any further flux of potassium from left to right. So, the, the system would have reached equilibrium at this point. So, in this state you still have a voltage a higher voltage on the right side compared to the left. Compared to the left. Initially we start off with a, with, a, with a configuration where both the compartments are neutral electrically neutral, but because of the presence of uh, a semi permeable membrane and a differential in the concentrations of the solution. Right, we have ended up with a situation where there is higher voltage on the right compared to the left. Okay, and this voltage that you get is, is the equilibrium potential of the system. It is calculated by a formula called the Nernst potential. Okay, so in this this formula gives basically the relationship between the concentrations of the the ion that we are interested in, in this case uh, potassium ion, right, and the, the ratio of the concentrations between two compartments, and the voltage difference between the two compartments. These two quantities are related by this uh, formula. So, you see that in this formula on the right side you have uh, capital R which is the uh, ideal gas constant, then the capital T which is absolute temperature, then Zx is the valence of the ion. Uh, so, for example, sodium has valence of plus 1, uh, potassium has valence of plus 1 and so on and so forth. F is a Faraday's constant. So, at room temperature of uh, 25 degrees centigrade uh, the RT by F for valence equal to plus 1 turns out to be 26 millivolts and that can be used for uh, simplifying your calculations of uh, Nernst potential. 
So, and then you have this, so this is a factor, then you have ln which is a natural logarithm of the ratio of uh, the concentrations on the right side or x 2 by x 1. So, you see that the voltage difference between compartment 1 to 2 is related to the ratio of the concentrations between compartment 2 to 1. Okay. So, if you remember that we will calculate some of the Nernst potentials of various ionic species uh, in a moment. Okay, so, uh, each ionic species whether it is sodium or potassium uh, creates a kind of a Nernst potential uh, depending upon the ratio of concentrations of these ionic species between inside and outside of the neuron. So, we already have described that each of these ionic species has certain uh, ratio, uh, has certain differential uh, distribution between inside and outside. So, because of this each of these ionic species produces a certain Nernst potential. So, therefore, uh, a given uh, channel can be represented by a kind of a battery uh, which is whose um, voltage is equal to the Nernst potential of the channel. And also the channel itself has a conductance because it allows uh, ions which is a current. So, the structure allows passage of current therefore, it has some conductance. So, the whole ion channel analytically speaking can be represented as a series of a, a, a conductance uh, and a battery. So, this is a dis, uh, represented on the right side of the slide uh, as a series circuit of a conductance uh, G channel which corresponds to the conductance of the channel and uh, E Nernst which corresponds to the Nernst potential of that channel and the corresponding uh, ionic uh, concentrations. So, uh, so, basically you can represent a channel as a series of a conductance and a, uh, and a, and a battery which is the Nernst potential. Now, here we have two situations. So, you have some channels which are voltage dependent where they have voltage gating and there are channels which are not voltage dependent. So, they are voltage independent. So, if the channel is voltage dependent then uh, that means it can open or close by function of uh, voltage uh, or membrane voltage. So, therefore, the conductance of this channel can be uh, variable because open channel means it can allow passage of ions more easily which means it has higher conductance. So, uh, whenever you represent a voltage dependent ion channel uh, the corresponding conductance is a variable and that variability is denoted by that uh, arrow which cuts across the conductance as shown in the figure. And uh, so, now let us look at the Nernst potential of uh, uh, potassium. So, potassium like we described before is uh, low in concentration outside and high in concentration inside and if you plug in these two values. So, it is outside it is 20 millimolar, inside it is 400 millimolar. If you plug in these values you get a Nernst potential of uh, potassium E k as minus 77 millivolts. And below that you have G k which is the conductance of uh, potassium channels uh, under resting conditions. So, that is 6, 36 milli siemens uh, per centimeter square. So, therefore, a uh, potassium equivalent circuit can be represented by a series of uh, a conductance G k right, and uh, a battery E k. So, now let us calculate the Nernst potential, so potential of uh, sodium. So, sodium is high outside 400 millimolar and low inside 60 millimolar. Uh, therefore, if you plug these two number numbers into the formula, right, you get an ENA value of 50 millivolts. So, sodium Nernst potential is a positive value. And then GNA, the conductance of sodium channels under resting conditions, is 120 milli siemens per centimeter square. So, therefore, the sodium equivalent circuit can be described uh, as a series of a conductance and a uh, battery where conductance is GNA and the battery is ENA. Then there is a, so you have uh, like I said two kinds of channels membrane uh, voltage dependent and voltage independent. So, voltage independent channels are kind of open all the time, they are, they are, not, they, they, they are not controlled by voltage. So, therefore, uh, they, they are called leakage channels because they kind of imagine that they are leaking ions all the time from inside to outside. Uh, so, these channels can be represented by a constant conductance, so that they are not variable and in series with a battery which is called uh, the kind of the Nernst potential of the leakage channels. So, there is one more electrical element in a neural membrane which we have to consider if you want to, to in order to understand the electrical activity of a neuron. Uh, that element is the cell membrane itself. So, we have described before that the cell membrane consists of two sheets of lipids or these fatty molecules right and uh, these two sheets form a kind of insulating uh, sheet right insulating cover for the neuron and uh, they can be compared to a what is called a parallel plate capacitor which you might have studied in your high school uh, circuit theory. Uh, 
Okay, so we can represent the membrane itself as a as a parallel plate capacitor as a capacitor. So if you combine all these observations, you can construct a kind of a circuit model of the neural membrane, and this circuit model consists of a capacitance which represents the cell membrane itself, and then uh, you have uh, one uh, conductance and uh, battery branch which represents sodium uh, channels, and then the next one represents the potassium channel, and the last one represents the leakage channels. So this whole thing uh, is a circuit model of uh, right of a neural membrane. So now let us consider uh, what happens in this circuit under under ideal conditions, under uh, steady state conditions. So that means there is no, nothing is changing in this in the circuit. You know, currents are all constant and voltage is constant. Right? If you consider that kind of situation, you can do some simple analysis from your circuit theory, and I'm not going to go into the details of these calculations. But it is suffices to just uh, understand that this is the formula that gives you the relationship between the conductances and the noise potentials right and the membrane voltage so it goes as vm is equal to gna ena plus gk ek plus gl el divided by gna plus gk plus gl so now under resting state let us see what is the vm value that we get now under resting state it so happens that potassium channels are open and sodium channels are closed so that is the that's how these channels work in resting state uh, what that means is uh, sodium conductance is much lesser than potassium conductance and typically leakage conductance is, uh, is generally very low. So that is also taken to be much lesser than GK. So GK dominates the formula right in under resting state. So if you plug in these conditions into the formula here right in the numerator uh, GK EK term becomes dominant, in the denominator GK terms becomes dominant. So if you make these approximations right you get Vm is approximately equal to GK EK by GK which is equal to EK. So Vm is approximately equal to Ek, and Ek we already calculated to be minus 77 millivolts. Uh, actually, Vm under resting conditions is is about minus 70 millivolts. So it's kind of close to the Ek value of a very low negative value of minus 77 millivolts. So let us consider what happens under in the in excited state. So in excited state, uh, it turns out that potassium channels are closed and sodium channels are open. So that means in this case. Uh, GK is, a, is, is much lesser than GNA and GL is also much lesser than GNA. So if you plug in these conditions into the formula here right, and then in the numerator you have GNA, ENA which dominates the expression. In the denominator it is the GNA which dominates the whole summation. So if you, if you assume that then you have uh, the formula becomes GNA, ENA by GNA which is equal to ENA. So therefore Vm in this condition. Uh, is approximately equal to ENA and ENA we know is uh, plus 50 millivolts and actually if you do not make this approximation VM uh, when there is when the cell is excited will go as far as like you know 10, 20, 30 millivolts which is a positive uh, voltage. So basically what we understand from this very simplified uh, calculations is that sodium and potassium channels can be used as two knobs to turn VM up and down. So if you want to increase Vm, you basically open more sodium channels and close potassium channels. If you want to decrease Vm, open more potassium channels and close more sodium channels. So this, this is like you know two knobs which you can control to turn Vm up and down. So with this background now we can understand uh, what exactly drives the generation of an action potential. So we have already seen in the previous segment that as you when you give a current pulse to the to the neuron. At the, at the point here, uh, say axon hillock. As you gradually increase the current pulse amplitudes, there will be a threshold amplitude at which uh, suddenly the neuron uh, membrane voltage uh, shows this sharp upward excursion and then which also rapidly falls down and that is called the action potential. Why is AP generated at the axon hillock? So main reason is that uh, we have this high density uh, of uh, voltage dependent sodium potassium channels in the neighborhood of axon hillock and also uh, on the uh, all along the axon. Okay, so if that is uh, if that is true, then uh, what exactly ha happens and how is AP generated? So basically, when you give your current pulse, right, you give a uh, current pulse into inject a current pulse into the neuron, and since you are in inputting a positive charge into the neuron, that increases the membrane voltage. And when the membrane voltage increases towards positive values, and because the sodium channels are voltage dependent, and they tend to open. Right when the membrane voltage is increased, so sodium channels open. 
and we have just uh, realized that when you open sodium channels that tends to increase the membrane potential. So, you have a interesting positive feedback situation here. So, your initial current injection increases the membrane voltage which in turn increases opens further uh, sodium channels and these in turn increase the membrane voltage further and this process goes on a little bit. Uh, and then uh, about this time the potassium channels also start opening right and then when as potassium channels start opening we know that uh, increased potassium channel opening uh, causes redu reduction of uh, membrane potential. So, membrane potential starts dropping and it drops uh, back to the resting value and the process ends there. Okay, so, this can be uh, seen in this series of images. So, in this image you see that uh, the membrane potential is increasing uh, this is called the rising phase. So, at this point you have the sodium channels opening right and uh, so, sodium channels are opening during this uh, phase. Uh, so, then, then you see that in this figure you see the falling phase of the action potential right the voltage is now coming back from the peak value to back to the baseline value of uh, minus 70 millivolts and this is called the falling phase and during this phase the voltage sensitive potassium channels are, op are op have begun to open they are opening. Now, in the third phase which is called the hyperpolarization phase or the second the part of the action potential uh, where the voltage goes below the baseline value of uh, minus 70 millivolts. It is called hyperpolarization because it is less than the normal baseline value of minus 70 and uh, it, during this stage the sodium channels have closed now by this time and potassium channels are still open therefore, the membrane potential goes, goes very close to the E k value of minus 77. Okay, this can be uh, compared to a kind of a interesting real world uh, you know system uh, it is kind of slightly disgusting, but it is a very appropriate analogy because what happens in action potential is as you, uh, if you, if you as you increase your uh, current pulse amplitude the threshold value at which suddenly the membrane voltage shows a sharp rise and in a fall the, which is the action potential and that is exactly what happens in this very familiar device called the flush, toilet flush. So, in a toilet flush right, when you turn this knob if you give the knob a little little nudge right uh, you can, there may be a little leakage of water, but nothing much happens. But once you turn the knob by a certain critical angle then kind of whole hell uh, breaks loose and and all the water in the tank flows into the flush and then once that's, that process begins uh, you have reached a point of no return and you cannot stop that midway. Okay, so, the, the whole thing has to you know flow uh, before, before it, you can flush it again. Uh, so, okay, uh, so, this is what uh, not the toilet flush, but uh, the whole process of uh, action potential generation and the molecular machinery that uh, underlies the action potential generation. This was uh, developed by Hodgson and Huxley as we have discussed in the very first lecture and they got a Nobel Prize for their uh, brilliant work uh, in 1963. I want to discuss one more aspect of this action potential generation. So, if you look at, so we have seen that as you increase the current pulse amplitude your voltage response also increases and at a critical value of the current pulse your voltage response becomes abnormally high. Now, in the right graph on this slide uh, we are looking at the input current amplitude on the x axis and on the y axis it is all output voltage amplitude. So, you can see that as input current amp amplitude increases gradually up to certain point the output voltage amplitude also increases gradually and pretty much uh, very much linearly. But once the input current amplitude crosses a certain threshold the output voltage suddenly increases to a very high value and after that uh, since action potential has a fixed amplitude and uh, duration there is no change in the amplitude after that we current increase the current amplitude right there is no change in the amplitude of the action potential. So, the relationship between output voltage amplitude and input current amplitude looks like a kind of a step right which is a nonlinear relationship. Okay, where is this nonlinearity coming from? This nonlinearity is coming from the nonlinearity that, that exists at the level of ion channel. So, therefore, the nonlinearity in the current versus voltage relationship which exists at the level of an ion channel is getting translated into the nonlinearity in, in the current versus voltage relationship at the whole neuron level which is what we have seen in the previous slide. Now, how do we say that the current voltage relationship of an ion channel is nonlinear? Now, let us look go back to our again high school uh, physics and recall Ohm's law. So, Ohm's law says that voltage is proportional to uh, current and the proportionality is given by the resistance R V is equal to I R or uh, this can also be expressed as I equal to G V where G is the conductance and uh, so uh, G is equal to 1 by R. 
So, therefore, uh, resistances which follow this law, Ohm's law, are called ohmic resistances or ohmic conductances. So, when you have an ohmic conductance, the current versus voltage relationship looks like what you are looking at, what you are seeing in the left graph, right? Voltage is on the x axis, current is on the y axis, and the relationship between the two is linear. So, it is a linear relationship. But suppose uh, G itself is a function of voltage, uh, which is like what is happening in case of voltage dependent channels. The channel conductance is varies as a function of membrane voltage. Uh, so, that means the G, the conductance is a function of the voltage. So, if G is a function of voltage, then the I V equal to I R is no more as the a linear relationship. The graph that depicts the relationship between I and V is no more a straight line, it will be a some kind of a curve. So, a conductance which follows this kind of a current voltage relationship is called a non ohmic conductance, and the relationship is a nonlinear relationship. So, therefore, uh, the nonlinearity that exists at level of single channels right, translates into a nonlinearity in the response of the whole neuron to input current. So, uh, so the thing is if you did not have voltage dependent channels, if you had only volt, voltage independent channels like the leakage channels, the neural response would be you know linear to input current, you will never have any action potentials. Right? And uh, whereas, because of the voltage dependent channels, right, neural response is nonlinear, you have this kind of a step like uh, response in the voltage. Now, this has a lot of significance because it is these voltage dependent channels present in neurons that are making neurons so powerful as computing devices and it is these neurons that make the brain a very powerful computing device. And all the secret of brain's intelligence and right abilities right have their roots ultimately in the special structure of the neuron and neurons signaling capabilities right ultimately have their roots in the special channels called the voltage dependent channels. Uh, because uh, because the voltage dependent channels are nonlinear, you know the whole neural response is, is nonlinear and makes it a very very powerful computing uh, device. Uh, whereas if you had only voltage independent channels, then the the neuron will be simply be having resistance and capacitances. So it, so neuron will then be like a uh, resistance and capacitor circuit or a RC circuit, and these circuits are linear. You can't build the modern computers uh, with these kinds of circuits. To build a modern computers, we need electronic circuits which are all nonlinear. So, for example, if you look at you know diodes and transistors, right, and you know and the whole VLSI technology, uh, they they are based on nonlinear circuits, right? And it is this which has ushered in the computer revolution. So, just as development of nonlinear devices, right, suddenly brought about a quantum jump, right, in the computing technology and made computers possible, right, and uh, the existence of voltage dependent channels are very crucial for making neurons uh, powerful computing devices and for making brain what it is. Now, okay, let us go to uh, axon propagation. So, axons also have voltage dependent uh, sodium potassium channels all along the way, all, all along the length of the, ax, uh, the axons. Uh, therefore, uh, action potentials propagate without loss of amplitude along the axon. So, we have seen this animation in the previous segment. Uh, so, that is the action potential propagates along the axon it uh, does not lose amplitude, the amplitude is intact and its uh, width is also does not increase, right. The shape of the action potential uh, remains intact as this action potential propagates down the axon. We already mentioned once that, uh, so you have this myelin sheath uh, right, that forms around the axons and that is what gives you increasing conductance. So, I also looked at some of these numbers in an earlier lecture, right. So, you have this thick myelinated uh, axons or type A axons. Uh, which have bigger diameter and higher velocities and then unmyelinated axons or type C axons have smaller diameter and no myelin sheath and uh, smaller velocities. Okay, so, the way the action potentials propagate along an axon is quite interesting. So, myelin sheath is not actually continuously present all along the length of the axon because myelin sheath is as you remember uh, are, is supplied by certain kinds of cells. These are the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and the Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. So, since they are cells, they only occupy a small stretch of uh, the axon and uh, so a series of these cells uh, try to cover the entire length of the axon. And between neighboring cells, there is a small gap on the axon which is not covered by the myelin sheath. So, therefore, myelin sheath gives, so right, uh, because, of, because it makes the cable thicker, it uh, gives you increased conduction velocity. So, as action potential propagates along the axon, Right and uh, so uh, while it is propagating in the stretch where there is myelin sheath, it propagates fast. And then when it comes to this junction point, 
uh, between two successive myelin sheets, right? It slows down a little bit uh, because there there is no myelin sheet and connection velocity suddenly becomes uh, smaller. So it slows down. It slows down a little bit in these uh, junction points, which are actually called nodes of Ranvier. So, so and after that again for the next myelin sheet it speeds up again. So if you do a, a, a kind of a slow motion simulation of the way in which uh, the action potential is propagating, you will see it zipping across the myelin sheet and then slowing down a little bit and then zipping across the next myelin sheet and slowing down and so on and so forth. So it looks as if uh, the action potential is jumping from node to node, one node of Ranvier to next node of Ranvier. This kind of a conduction is called saltatory conduction. So now let us come to the final uh, step which is a synapse. So we already seen in the previous segment that the, at the, the signal transmission at the synapse is a, is a chemical step and uh, so where a chemical is released by the presynaptic terminal and which uh, is recognized by the postsynaptic terminal and converted into an electrical si uh, signal called the postsynaptic potential. So let us see exactly what happens. So here you have a simple schematic of a synapse. You can see the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic terminal. And action potential from the axon of the presynaptic neuron arrives at the presynaptic terminal, right? And uh, which produces on the postsynaptic side a postsynaptic potential. So, what exactly happens at the synapse? So, presynaptic terminal releases a substance called uh, a neurotransmitter, and this neurotransmitter substance or molecule binds with a receptor on the postsynaptic side, and because of this binding event, and the receptor opens or closes an ion channel. So, you can see that in this picture. So the neurotransmitter uh, present in the uh, presynaptic terminal is actually packaged in little spheres called vesicles and uh, these vesicles are held uh, in place uh, because of some uh, protein bonds uh, which keeps the, which, which, by which the vesicles are tethered uh, right, uh, in, in place on the presynaptic terminal. So when the action potential comes uh, to the presynaptic terminal, the locally the membrane potential increases uh, to a high positive value. And because of that, uh, there are these uh, voltage dependent calcium channels which are present on the presynaptic side, which are not shown in this uh, figure. So, so, when these voltage sensitive calcium channels open, calcium that is present outside, and you know that calcium is uh, present in high concentration outside and low inside, therefore, calcium rushes from outside to inside. And calcium ions rush in and then break these bonds which keep the vesicles intact in place, right? And, and when that happens, the vesicles start drifting towards uh, the cell membrane. And uh, so they, they fuse with the cell membrane and release their contents, new, the neurotransmitter molecules, into the synaptic cleft. And there, in the inside the once inside the synaptic cleft, the neurotransmitter molecules diffuse across the short gap of the uh, synaptic cleft and arrive at the postsynaptic membrane. And then there they bind with the receptors. So let us see how that happens in this more detailed picture. So the neurotransmitter molecules, which has diffused across the synaptic cleft. Is, is arriving at a ion channel which is in the closed state on, on the left side of the figure and uh, the neurotransmitter molecule then binds with the receptor. So in this, in this case actually the receptor is, a, uh, is kind of like a part of the ion channel itself. So one part of the ion channel, ion channel is a basically a large protein with lots of parts, these are called subunits. So the neurotransmitter molecule binds with a part of this ion channel which is the receptor itself and the shape of the receptor and the shape of the neurotransmitter match in some sense. Therefore, the binding of neurotransmitter and the receptor is described as some kind of a lock and key mechanism. So when this binding takes place, uh, that event produces uh, certain changes in the shape of the ion channel and because of which the channel opens and allows passage of ions. And when there is a flow of ions whether in, from outside to inside or inside to outside, that gives rise to a change in the membrane potential right? and uh, that is how the chemical signal that is released by the presynaptic terminal is converted to, to an electrical signal on the postsynaptic side. So receptors of two broad uh, types, uh, they are these ionic, ionotropic uh, receptors which are where the receptor is directly linked to an ion channel, it is actually part of the ion channel and responses in these kinds of receptors is, is fast. And then there are these metabotropic uh, channels where the activation of receptors leads to a chemical cascades, right? Uh, so after a long cascade of signals the binding event between the neurotransmitter and the receptor uh, triggers a chemical cascade of signals. At the end of that cascade, it uh, opens a channel and producing a flux of ions. So in this, in this figure on the left side, you see this direct neurotransmitter action uh, which is a, an example of the anotropic receptor. On the right side, you see an example of a metabotropic receptor. 
So, now what makes a synapse excitatory or what makes a synapse inhibitory? So, we have seen in the previous segment that uh, in the excitatory synapses, the, the PSP is a positive uh, voltage uh, wave, voltage deflection. So, uh, you get an EPSP, right? And that happens because the neurotransmitter receptor binding event opens a sodium channel and therefore, sodium rushes in on the postsynaptic side and thereby increasing the membrane voltage and producing an EPSP. An example of excitatory neurotransmitter molecule is glutamate. So, similarly, if you look at in inhibitory synapses, right, when the uh, neurotransmitter receptor binding event takes place, it opens either potassium or chloride uh, channels on the postsynaptic side, uh, thereby decreasing the postsynaptic potential and, and creating an IPSP. An example of inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA. Uh, so, let us look at uh, these two. Uh, most prominent and most commonly found neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, there is glutamate, which is excitatory neurotransmitter and which has uh, three kinds of receptors, uh, three receptor classes, uh, AMPA, NMDA and kinate. And AMPA receptor, when it is, uh, when the, when glutamate binds with AMPA receptor, it opens uh, most uh, sodium channels, right. And when it binds with uh, NMDA receptors, it opens uh, a channel which, uh, which permits both sodium and calcium. And when it binds with kinate uh, receptors, it open it, the the opening of the channel uh, permits both sodium and potassium. And GABA has is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, it has a receptor. It has an anotropic receptor which is GABA A. And when this binding event takes place between GABA and GABA A, uh, it opens uh, chloride channels. So one more concept which we should introduce in this context is a concept of synaptic strength. So we have said that uh, there are two kinds of uh, synapses: excitatory inhibitory. And, but we also mentioned in the last segment that the PSP is a graded signal unlike action potential which has a fixed size and shape, a PSP can have uh, variable amplitudes. So, for a given action potential on the presynaptic side, if you produce a strong or a high amplitude PSP, you say that the synapse is strong. So, similarly for a given action potential on the presynaptic side, if the PSP produced is a, has a small amplitude, then you say the synapse is weak. Now, this denotes kind of the strength of the synapse. Right, and uh, this synaptic strength can also be varied uh, with uh, as a function of the ongoing activity uh, on the synapse. And uh, so, this concept is called the synaptic strength. And variation of the synaptic strength is a basis is, is called plasticity. And uh, that is this change in synaptic strength is thought to be the basis of learning and memory. And we'll encounter this uh, concept uh, more and again and again in in future classes. So, just to wrap up uh, basically what we have seen uh, so far in this two segments of this lecture is you know you have uh, a neuron in the cell body and receiving inputs from other neurons via several dendrites. And in this figure uh, the, there are three dendritic lines and one dendritic line is carrying a positive PSP or an EPSP. The other two dendritic lines uh, carry uh, two IPSPs. If all of them when they when they add up or summate near soma right in this case the negatives dominate therefore, the cell does not get excited. So, the, it does not produce action potentials. Whereas, in this example in the topmost line the dendrite uh, there are two EPSP waves flowing in and the middle one there is only a single EPSP wave flowing in. In the bottom one there is a single IPSP wave coming in. When all of them add up in the soma right uh, the positives dominate the negative. So, therefore, the soma gets excited and produces action potentials which propagate down the axon. So, with this uh, you can think of neuron as some kind of a thresholding device. So, basically what neuron is doing is it is adding up inputs from other neurons right and uh, it is taking the positive inputs and the negative inputs adding up all of them. If the net sum of all these inputs crosses a threshold value, the neuron gets excited. If the net sum of all these inputs does not cross threshold value, it does not get excited. Okay, so, uh, this is a very simplistic description of neuron. I know that real neurons are lot more complicated than this. But this description is good enough to construct uh, models and to think about what uh, kind of communication between neurons happens in large networks. And uh, we can also describe how uh, different brain functions can, can, be, uh, can, can be accounted for using a simple neuron model like this. So, in the next lecture what we will do is we will start with this kind of a simplified neuron model and describe how you can uh, construct networks, large networks and with which uh, we will ex try to explain. Uh, lots of phenomena from uh, psychology and, and, and neuroscience. Thank you.